Good evening, everyone. My name is Audrey Davis, and I'm the director of the Alexandria Black History Museum. Thank you for attending this evening's program, Reparations at BTS, Uncovering a Not-So-Hidden History, Part 2. This, is this event is sponsored by the Alexandria Historical Society, the Alexandria Black History Museum, and the Alexandria Community Remembrance Project. All three organizations support and promote Alexandria's vibrant African-American history. Last year, our audience was the first to formally learn about the work that's happening at the Virginia Theological Seminary as part of their reparations project. Tonight, we will be receiving a one-year update on the progress that has been made in the last year. And as with last year, I am so pleased to introduce Ebony Davis, who will be speaking to us tonight. Ebony Davis is a public historian with a passion for sharing and preserving Black history. She holds an MA in Museum Studies and Historical Preservation from Morgan State University, and it's currently pursuing her, BH, her PhD in African Diaspora History at Howard University. For nearly 15 years, Davis has operated within the field of public history, working for local, state, and national institutions in the Americas and Africa. In 2017, Davis began working at the Virginia Theological Seminary, or DTS, as an archivist for the African American Episcopal Historical Collection. And in 2020, she transitioned to VTS's Office of Multicultural Ministries. As an associate for Multicultural Ministries Programming and Historical Research for Reparations, Davis coordinates the research efforts of, v of the VTS Reparations Program and works directly with the program's descendant families. So tonight it gives me great pleasure to turn our virtual podium over to Ebony Davis, who will give you a brief update uh, before we start discussion about the VTS reparations program. Ebony, thank you. Thank you, Audrey. I am happy to be with you again. Um, so I'm going to share my screen in a minute, um, but I would, uh, I'll give you um, a little breakdown of what the evening is going to be like. So as many of you know, last year we did this presentation and um, it included a lot of the specifics of the program. So I would like to invite you to find that um, recording on Alexandria, Historic Alexandria's YouTube to get all of the specifics of the program, or you can go to BTS's website, um, www.bts.edu for a, um, audio, a video that Dr. Joe Thompson and I recorded that explains the processes and policies of our program, because I won't get into that much detail this tonight. Um, tonight is more an overview and an update, and then we have um, a, a, a descendant joining us to share what her experience being a part of the program has been like. So in um, respect of the time, we really want to hear her voice and not so much of me. So I'm not going to give you too much. But with that said, I'm going to dive in and share my screen and begin. Julia Parker, Millie, and Sophie three enslaved women hired out from Mount Vernon. Carter Dowling, labored at the seminary until his escape in 1858. He was enslaved by the Fitzhugh family. Harriet Stewart McKnight Shorts, a washerwoman, her husband, Burr Shorts, a farmhand, and their 10 children were enslaved in the household of Cassius Lee, a seminary trustee, secretary, and treasurer. Joseph Terrell, Philip Terrell, John Terrell, William Terrell were also enslaved under Lee. Joseph and Philip were farmhands. John was a laborer and William a cook. Henrietta Henny Tate and William Tate were enslaved in the household of seminary faculty member Edward Lippitt. Matilda and Nathan Dixon, a washerwoman and farmhand respectively. Albert Fortune, enslaved by John Johns, fourth Bishop of Virginia, a founder of BTS and president of the Board of Trustees. Wallace Wanzer, a free man. Will Wright, carpenter and blacksmith who contracted his services out to the seminary both before and after the Civil War. Elizabeth York, a free black woman recorded in the household of Professor James May in 1850. Ann Curtis and William Russell, recorded in the household of seminary faculty member William Sparrow in 1870. Lewis Washington, a 25-year-old male 
recorded in the household of seminary faculty member Joseph Packer. Bernie Bunny McKnight, recorded as a domestic servant for Cassius Lee in 1870. Pleasant Green, recorded as a laborer at BTS from 1874 to 1886. John H. Peters Sr. and John H. Peters Jr., father and son recorded working for the seminary off and on throughout the 1930s. Jacob E. Terrell, recorded working on campus as a cook in 1970, 1917, excuse me. Rebecca Brooks, recorded working on campus as a cook in the 1930 census. Cora Lena Terrell, recorded working as a domestic in the seminary laundry in 1900. Rebecca Terrell, recorded working on campus as a cook in the 1930 Alexandria City Directory. Rebecca continued to work at the seminary through the 1940s. Norman Roy Sr. worked for Episcopal High School prior to 1930 and then worked at the seminary for over 20 years as a waiter, painter, and maintenance man. Leon Strange worked as a laborer at the seminary and at Episcopal High School. Robert Archie Strange recorded as working at Episcopal High School as early as 1880 worked there until his death in 1920. John Samuel Thomas Jr. He was first documented working as a janitor at BTS and then later as a laborer at Episcopal High School. Charles Wanzer III, listed in the 1957 Alexandria City Directory, working as a helper at the seminary. Edmonia E. Lewis, recorded as a BTS employee in the 1957 Alexandria City Directory. Joseph Wanzer worked at Episcopal High School as a janitor until his death in 1936. His wife, Fanny Sims Wanzer, worked as a home laundress for Episcopal High School, and their sons, Daniel, Llewellyn, and Joseph Jr. also worked there. Daniel G. Sims recorded working as a waiter at BTS in 1910. Wilmer B. Henry, worked at BTS and Episcopal High School as a janitor. Willie Mae Carter Henry worked at BTS as a charwoman. John Wesley Casey Sr. worked at Episcopal High School and BTS for over 45 years. George H. Casey worked at the seminary in the 1940s. Charles Casey worked at Episcopal High School and the seminary as a waiter and, January, and jan janitor, excuse me. Ada Virginia Casey worked as a maid at BTS. John Casey Jr., a cook at BTS. And Herbert Casey recorded working at the seminary as a cook and janitor in the 1940s and 50s. These 48 names belong to Black people who labored at BTS during the antebellum, Reconstruction, and Jim Crow eras. Among them are people who were freedmen, contraband, as well as those enslaved by BTS faculty and board members. After emancipation, Alexandria's strong and rich Black community served as a major labor source for the seminary. Dozens of individuals from multiple areas, multiple area families worked for the seminary in service positions like janitor, waiter, laundress, cook, farmhand, driver, helper, and domestic servant. Later, you will hear from the descendant of Wilmer and Willie Mae Carter Henry, who worked at the seminary in the 1930s and 40s. Their picture is here in the center. In September 2019, Virginia Theological Seminary announced the creation of an endowment dedicated to the payment of reparations and the intent to research, uncover, and recognize Black people who labored on campus during slavery, reconstruction, and segregation under Jim Crow laws. The endowment is part of the seminary's commitment to recognizing its participation in oppression in the past and commitment to healing and making amends in the future. Since that announcement, Additional funds have been allocated to support the work of Black congregations that have historical ties to the seminary, to create programs that promote justice and inclusion, and to elevate the work and voices of, a black, of black alumni and clergy within the Episcopal Church. 
Run by the Office of Multicultural Ministries, the reparations program is a two-fold initiative that includes a research team of historical and genealogical experts responsible for gathering historical documentation and conducting genealogical research to find living descendants. And an implementation effort, which is led by Dr. Joseph Thompson and I, and supported by the Dean's Task Force for Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. We are tasked with the administration of the program, specifically fostering relationships with the descendant families, assessing their needs and desires as beneficiaries, and determining the program's policies and managing its financial matters. Our research process goes in two main directions. Maddie and Elizabeth use historical records to find the names of enslaved persons who labored at the seminary. And then they work forward in time to see if they can locate living descendants. Researcher Char Bar, Char Ba, excuse me, starts with families still in this geographical area who are certain that their relatives worked here in the late 19th and or early 20th century. She then documents those family members and tries to trace the family's VTS connection as far back in time as possible. The Jim Crow era has yielded the largest volume of information to date. Alexandria has quite a vibrant and historic black community, and many within that community have ties to the seminary that go back several generations. Thus, we are fortunate to have the benefit of living memory aid us in the process of uncovering this history. On the antebellum side of our research, one of the principally important aspects has been establishing an understanding of what Alexandria's particular slave society looks like. In that vein, Maddie and her team have done a phenomenal job of mapping out the landscape that highlights the area's commercial and social industries, its needs for domestic labor versus physical labor and skilled labor, providing an understanding of the seasonality of labor, and most importantly, the centrality of the Episcopal Church to the inner workings of the institution of slavery in Virginia. So we've talked about a re the research a little bit, and I'll give you a quick overview of our implementation process by way of an example with a sample case. So this might be um, familiar to some of you who were here last year, but this is a fictitious sample, a case, sample case of a descendant family due reparations from BTS. In this example, Eliza Jackson, worked at, the, at BTS during the Jim Crow era. As members of the highest generation of this family that has living descendants, her three grandchildren, Keith, Francis, and Joanna, are the shareholders. As such, each of them will receive an individual share of the reparations fund. And because Keith is deceased, his share will be divided between his three children. It's worth noting that these shares are paid out annually in perpetuity and can be passed on from generation to generation. In summary, this is essentially a trust that we're creating with and for the families. We view this program as an opportunity to build relationships with the descendant community. One of the most tangible ways this program is working to achieve those intentions is through the disbursement of annual cash payments to the direct descendants of Black people who worked or were enslaved at the seminary between its founding in 1823 and its integration in 1951. So let's get into some of the research updates very quickly. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly through them and then we can go over them more in depth during the questions. Um, in the spring of last year, our research team was able to gain access to the VTS seminary archives um, after the library had been closed for renovation. And they came across these record books that had, that held construction records, meeting minutes, purchase receipts, and the names of black people, both free and enslaved who labored at the seminary. This find was particularly helpful in fortifying um, our, the fact that the history of the seminary's involvement with slavery was never hidden or lost, but that no one really ever just took the time to look for it. So finding these records within our very own records um, was something that really just, just made, drove that point home. Um, another thing that they found once they were able to really dig around in our archives was 
this these minutes from a 1944 board meeting. And I'm going to read all of it, even though I know you all can see it, because it's, it's worth saying out loud so we can understand what the climate was like at that time. Purchase of the Douglas Johnson property. The following resolution offered by Mr. Burke of Burke and Herbert Bank was unanimously adopted, resolved that the executive committee be authorized to buy the property of the late Douglas Johnson adjacent to the entrance gate of the seminary. Mr. Burke stated that the purpose of this resolution was to prevent the development of a Negro settlement in the near vicinity of the seminary. This particular resolution is authorizing the executive committee to purchase the land across Quaker Lane owned by Douglas Johnson, a black landowner whose descendants are a part of our program. Fortunately, after a search through the VTS and Fairfax County records, we were not able to find any evidence of this land purchase. So we don't believe it ever happened. We don't believe it ever happened. But the intent and overtness of the board is clear as the resolution passed unanimously. Another one of our spring 2021 finds was that of Carter Dowling. In 1858, Carter Dowling, enslaved by the Meade and Fitzhugh families, ran away from the seminary with two other gentlemen, Richard Bain and Benjamin Taylor. On their journey north, they stopped at the Philadelphia home of renowned Underground Railroad conductor and abolitionist, William Steele, and recorded the accounts of their escape. Carter was one of 11 children, all of whom he left behind. Thanks to the work of Maddie and her team, we have recently located the descendants of his siblings, some of which live in Baltimore. Now we can get into some of the specific programmatic updates. So far, of the 12 identified families whose ancestors have labored at BTS, the number of descendants who are actively participating in the program is 300. Roughly 100 of those descend those have, who have received the, those descendants, excuse me, have received payment, and 36 of that 100 have received their second annual payment. And just for reference, when when the program was first announced, um, our shareholder count was around 32. Um, and as the research continued, that number jumped from 32 to 112. And so when you have 112 shareholders, then you have to think of all of their children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews, whoever is their next direct living descendant. Um, and that's what gets you into that 300 number for our participating um, members within this program. And so we are now on our second round of payments and we'll be um, soon entering into our third fiscal year and our third round of payments. So the, the program is in full swing, if, if you will, um, and moving at a full, full, full speed. The seminary has also awarded two reparations grants as part of our additional initiatives tied to the program to historically black Episcopal churches. And lastly, I would like to note um, one of the most important parts of this program is the opportunity to build relationships with the descendant community. Um, and we were afforded that opportunity in a very special way last summer by hosting our very first inaugural descendant gathering. Um, what was supposed to be a small luncheon at the pub on the seminary's campus, 1823, for the program shareholders in this family. Um, it started with um, two or three shareholders wanting to get together on campus because they had not seen one another because of COVID and other issues where the city would not let them gather even before COVID. And it grew and grew and grew. And we had um, in that door that you see in the back, 
that area was set up very nicely for a small little lunch and all of these wonderful people came and we overflowed into the refectory as you see and so while it was an informal occasion it was really full and rich with stories and gathering um and it embodied the those intangible priorities that we have for the program that focus on communities and relationships and and storytelling and truth telling and so um it, it really just was a, a really blessed blessed occasion and um we are looking forward to hosting our next gathering which will be a formal gala on the evening of june 3rd in conclusion it warrants noting that this work is new to all of us. We've therefore tried to make the program flexible and capable of evolving, but this is just the beginning of a long-term process. We are finding that the policies and procedures that we have used so far have been effective, and we are getting good feedback from, fam from the families. This is not easy work. It's complicated and messy and heartbreaking and frustrating and uncomfortable um, and exhausting, but it is necessary. There's no one right way to do it, um, but as long as we continue to try, I think we might get there. Each family and each individual descendant have their own expectations, opinions, and personal relationship with the history of this institution and with their ancestors. Thus, at its core, this work is simply about a chance to try and right a wrong, to humbly atone and respect the outcome, whatever it may be. Thank you. Thank you, Ebony. That was a wonderful update. And it's such a pleasure to have you back again because this was one of our most popular lectures and talks. And I know uh, tonight will be even more special because you have a special guest with you. But before we get to our special guest, I wanted to ask you, on a personal level in this last year uh, that you've been working with the program and seeing it flourish, uh, what, have you, what have been your personal triumphs for the program? And then also, what, what are, are there any things that you would, have, you would do differently or that you think about doing differently? <laughs> um, I think what I have most enjoyed is the the personal nature of this work and i think this also this is what also makes it a little bit difficult to do this work too because um it's a it's a one-on-one -on -one process as much as the descendants allow um i'm talking to them on the phone quite a lot we're emailing back and forth or i'm talking to their children or grandchildren or niece or nephew um taking care of all of this and so you get to you get close, um, <laughs> which is amazing. You get to learn about these families. You get to learn about these people far more than just who they are as connected to the seminary, but who they are just as individuals in their own right. Um, and that's something that um, Tonette can share too. Like she has shared with me things that have that are happening to it in her life in New Jersey that have nothing to do with VTS. Um, and that's part of it that makes it really exciting. Um, I love. Family is very important to me. I come from a big old family, so I like talking to cousins and aunties. And so it just feels good. And I feel I feel like I know what I'm doing because I know <laughs> I know I know this, you know. Um, but on sometimes that can get hard because it's you get close and, and and you get you get tied to it and some of the stories are really sad and and then sometimes it's it's hard to disengage and you take it home with you. Um, so that's that's the, the downside of the personal. Um, if I were to do it differently, I would maybe figure out boundaries a little bit better upfront. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's no way to say what I would do differently because no one's ever done this. So um, Joe and I really try to give ourselves grace. Um, we I don't think I'm going to get it right every time. I know I'm going to mess up and um, that's that's the nature of it and so with that understanding i approach it and then we you know we go from there yeah and i think i mean you're building bridges and you're making connections and i think learning this history and discovering uh this history and it's going to be so valuable for our city 
Uh, I was saying to you earlier uh, today that I was in your neck of the woods when I was, uh, and, I, and I'd like to mention this now because uh, this family was such an important part of Alexandria history, but uh, the funeral today was today for uh, Nelson Green Jr. and his daughter, uh, Nina Green, uh, and it was held at the chapel at Episcopal High School. And I was thinking as I was sitting outside, uh, taking a break for a moment and seeing all the families going in and all the connections in Alexandria and thinking this is, this is a history of Alexandria right here in this room. All these people, all of these experiences dating back hundreds of years. I mean, it's just amazing to be able to make these connections and have this happen with the reparations program. And I know tonight, that you've brought a, a very special guest to be with us. And I'd like for you to introduce uh, your guest to our audience tonight, and we can have a, a chat with her about her experience of being part of the program. Yes. So I would like to welcome Miss Tonette Duncan. She is the granddaughter of Wilmer and Willie Mae Henry, who I, um, I focused in on their photo during the presentation. Um, both Wilmer and Willie Mae worked at the seminary and um, a number of Tonette's other relatives as well. And then if you expand it to her extended family and as much as all of these families are related by blood or marriage in some way, <laughs> then everybody worked at the seminary. Right. Um, so she is very much connected, um, not only to the seminary directly through her grandparents, but also through Oakland Baptist Church, which is her family's church, um, which is also a part of the program. Um, we are working with one of Oakland Baptist Church and Mead Memorial Episcopal Church as part of the reparations program as well. So she, she fits in on both of those areas and she is with us to share her experience. Um, so I welcome you, Tonette, and I'm gonna kick it off with one question to you and you can um, take it in whatever direction you would like. But if you could share with us um, a little bit about your grandparents and, and their, their story and how it relates to the seminary and, and to you, of course. Thank you, Ebony. Thank you, Audrey, as well, uh, for inviting me tonight and to let me be able to talk about my family briefly. <laughs> you can talk about all of them, so I'll concentrate on my grandparents. Um, they both worked at the seminary, as you said, in fact, and when Shaw was doing some of the background um, research, she found out that not only did my grandfather work there, but his grandfather, which would have been my great grandfather. So in 1917, it seems like my grandfather started working there with his dad. Uh, he was 19 and he was a helper at the time at the um, seminary. Um, our family, the Henry family comes from, if I pronounce it correct, Akadink, Virginia. And my grandfather, my grandmother's family, the Carters came from Culpeper, Virginia. Um, my grandfather not only worked at the seminary, but he also worked at the Episcopal High School, which I know is not part of this program, but they are, um, were a large employer as well. He started working there in like, I think 1941. I think that's what the records say. Uh, my grandmother's work history with the seminary was as a charwoman, which is an interesting occupation, as well as with the, the laundry. So she worked there, I think when she was in her mid twenties. Um, but of course they did other things other than just work at the seminary. My grandfather was actually the barber for the seminary uh, community. So on Saturdays, he would be cutting the hair of uh, you know the neighbors who came to get their hair cut. He also played the guitar. And my cousin Rita reminded me, not only did he play the guitar, but he played the harmonica too. So he was the entertainer. Um, he played privately as well as, um, you know, I guess a dance says, or whatever they called them then, maybe juke joints, maybe, I'm not really certain. <laughs> Um, they had a property and you may call it a small farm because he had on one side, it was a house. And then on the other side, it was a large garden where he had vegetables and we even have chickens. And I think we remember as kids running to get in the house before the, the rooster would always try to chase you. So, you know, those little things you remember. 
he was an avid um, religious person who read his Bible and he practiced as a Jehovah Witness more so than he wasn't a Baptist. The rest of us were, but he was a Jehovah Witness and um, he was just strong in his faith. And, you know, when I think about it, it makes you smile of what you remember about your grandparents because they're, you know, they're always the ones who hug you up and tell you, don't worry about anything. Things are going to be okay. Um, my grandmother, well, before I say that, they had five children together. Um, my mother, Corrine, uh, my Aunt Marie, who just recently passed away. In fact, yesterday was a year since she had passed. So bless you. Um, my uncle, John, and we have one uncle that's still living in the house, Burnett. He still is at 1021 Woods Place. So he's still there. Um, my mother had MS, so my grandmother stopped working and she needed 24 seven care. And she also, she was in the newspaper from time to time for being a patient um, at the Alexandria Hospital. And of course, you know, during the segregation, um, I guess medical treatment wasn't as we could have had it then. So um, she really, uh, it really affected her quite um, seriously. She never had, I never saw her walk and that always impacted my thought as to what did she really look like other than seeing her in pictures. I never really saw her standing up as a child. So, you know, I think about that sometimes. Uh, she was also in the newspaper once because her birthday was celebrated and the nurses were there with her as she celebrated her birthday being in the hospital. So my grandmother was also known uh, at the Oakland Baptist Church when she was 94. She was celebrated as the mother of the church because she was the oldest member. Um, subsequent, as I just mentioned about my Aunt Marie, when she turned 96, she was celebrated as the mother of the church in Oakland. So we do have a long history with Oakland Baptist Church. And, um, and I think I mentioned before we started that Rita's father, Eldridge Murphy, was the photographer for many families in Alexandria. So I know that uh, you're aware of that. Um, and I guess you probably heard of my Aunt Elizabeth Douglas Dawkins, where she was um, celebrated as one of the living legends of Alexandria. So the Henry family is well immersed in the Alexandria, Virginia uh, history. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. That, that was wonderful. You do have an amazing family with so many connections. And as I was sharing with you that uh, the photographs of Eldridge Murphy uh, was one of the first really big photography shows that we had at the museum uh, in, the, in the 90s and probably was our biggest attended uh, exhibition. And his look at the African-American community around Alexandria is truly amazing. And we are very pleased that Rita has allowed us to retain some copies of the photographs in our collection and they they aid us greatly in giving us a sense of of the city and and the people in it. Uh, one of the questions I had for you, when did you first hear about the reparations program and what did you first think when you heard about it? Well, it was I think um, it was an article in the paper where they were, uh, it was expressing that the uh, Virginia Theological Seminary was uh, was initiating a reparation program, which, you know, as a whole globally, when we talk about reparations, we think, is this really going to happen? So when I thought about it, I wrote to uh, Reverend Tom Thompson, if I'm saying his name correctly, Thompson Thomas Thompson, and he wrote me back and he actually told me that Shar Barr would be the person who would get in touch with me. Wealth and knowledge, so such a, a in her field, she's such an expert. Um, and we connected and started working together of pulling my family's history together. And I just thought, you know, this is just gonna be a wonderful program because it's more than just a monetary uh, receipt, but it's giving an organization or institution, the they're taking ownership of saying, we participated in something that was such a grievous situation to a people and they're taking ownership to say we need to give back we want to acknowledge the wrongdoings that happened during slavery and the Jim Crow era so 
I thought that it was just a wonderful thing that they were doing. And I wanted to highlight something that, that you said, Ms. Duncan, and also that Ebony was saying about your research team. You really have a, a crack research team that are doing excellent work. And some, uh, I checked looking at our participants list and some, uh, including Sharba, who is on our, um, on the Zoom tonight. And also I believe Elizabeth Grembliss, if I'm pronouncing her, her name correctly. And I think Maddie McCoy uh, as well too. And if I'm missing anybody, Ebony, let me know. But I think that they are very skilled researchers and have done amazing things uh, in uncovering this history. And we're very proud that we've had a long working relationship with Shar and with Maddie, uh, and especially with our ACRP work with our Alexandria Community Remembrance Project. And currently um, uh, we have Shar Barr and Leslie Anderson working to find descendants of our two lynching victims, uh, Joseph McCoy, uh, who was lynched on April 23rd, 1897, and Benjamin Thomas, who was lynched on August 8th, 1899. But it's amazing all the ties and connections. And I was really impressed, Ebony, when you showed the picture of the descendant luncheon and how large that was and bringing everybody together and to share this information. And uh, Ms. Duncan, when you, you, know, you reached out about the reparations program, did you have any hesitation being part of it? Uh, were there um, or were you fully on board once you heard about it and, uh, and once you had talked to, to staff at VTS? No, I was fully on board because I recognized that it's historical of what we're doing. And to, to know that as Ebony read off the list of, of um, people who have worked there and just the thought that they're being recognized and how can we memorialize that they were there they existed and just not, you know, it's that document that you show where land was tried to be purchased so that we wouldn't be known people, um, that we, we matter, that we're the same as any other human being on this earth, that we matter, we have value, we have worth. And yes, I was fully on board and, and, and working with the seminary to know that, yes, thank you for taking this project on and my family and myself, we're on board with it. And as Ebony said, with the seminary, since we're all so uh, meshed together and tangled, you know, you talk about a Wanza, there's a Henry somewhere that's related. You talk about a Terrell, there's a Wanza somewhere. So we're all intertwined, connected. So yes, if you take one of us, you're gonna take us all, so yes. <laughs> well, you, you brought up a very important point when you were referencing what um, Ebony had had in her presentation about the fact that they were trying to create that um, it was um, creating the the sort of covenant so that you could not have uh, African Americans moving into a parcel of land or or having access to that. And we had a comment uh, that was in the chat from uh, Dr. Kristen Moon, who's also on the Zoom and who's also written the amazing uh, history of the fort uh, community. And uh, this was a comment that she put in that um, BTS sold land in the 1940s for the development of, Cap of Chapel Hill next to the seminary neighborhood and inserted a Caucasian only restricted covenant. And so when you're hearing things like that and you're, and people ask why reparations, this is why reparations that you are being prevented from moving into a certain place, from putting your children into certain schools, you are not being allowed to have the kind of life that would allow your family to thrive. And yet your family is connected to the seminary, working with the seminary, right. providing a service to the seminary for many, many years that has been not recognized until recently. Absolutely. And so it's it's really, it's a very important reason why a reparations program like this is not only groundbreaking, but it's necessary. And it really, and there's no way to equal the playing field and what was done but there is a way to bring a little bit of parity to families who really were prevented from having the kind of life that every American citizen is entitled, entitled to have. Uh, Ms. Duncan, another question for you. Would you, what would you say to other descendants who might be on the Zoom who have been hesitant? Uh, what would your advice be about participating uh, in the program with VTS? Well, my advice is that you're not necessarily doing it for yourself, even though monetarily may be for you. But what you're looking at is the your family's legacy, your family's um, history. And if there's any chance that perhaps you did have family members that worked 
at the seminary, no matter what type of position they had, um, come forward, contact Ebony, so that you'll know where's your family employed there. And that's part of your history. You wanna pass it on to your children. That's one of the things that we miss out as having, uh, as black um, people. Our history is not so readily available. And when we can find it, when we can access it and record it, we wanna do that, definitely. We want to have existed and have value here. Yeah, that, I think that's very important and, and, and very well said, thank you. For saying that because it's not just about the person it, it it goes back decades and to family members and to family members who who are not here yet who are not born yet and absolutely it, yeah and it, it strengthens those family bonds and that family history which is so crucial because so many african-american families don't have that early history because it wasn't recorded wasn't valued and so this is a way that we can make sure that we keep documenting documenting these stories We've had a number of questions come into the chat, so I'm going to uh, take a few of those and um, send them out to you, um, Duncan, and to Ebony. Uh, one question that we had, Ebony, wanted you to confirm the two churches that have received reparations from BTS, just to confirm the names again. I believe it was Mead was one. Yeah, right? they have. They have not received reparations. Okay. They are. Um, we are hoping to begin working with them uh, and discussing how we can. Um, give reparations with both Mead Memorial Episcopal Church and Oakland Baptist Church, both um, historically black churches that had ties to the seminary, um, Episcopal ties for one, um, as, as an, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, um, uh, a, a mission of the seminary, that's not exactly correct, but the, the, the correct word is escaping me, and then Oakland Baptist, where many of our descendants um, went to and actually were founding members of and would, while working at the seminary, um, would take their leaves to go build the actual church at Oakland Baptist um, and then come back and do, you know, the work at the seminary as well. So as part of recognizing their value in the community um, and the uh, devaluing of those two churches by the seminary, this is, we're hoping to engage in as well. Thank you for clarifying that. That is really great. Uh, another question that we had come into the chat was, there is land in a Black community across from BTS along Seminary Road. Did you find any descendants in that community? Do we have a name for that or a street? Uh, not a name for a street, but the person who is asking the question, if you'd like to put that in the chat, I'll come, I'll come back to that. Okay, yeah, I, that doesn't sound familiar. I, I'm not saying it can't be the case, but um, it doesn't jump out at me directly. And another question that we have, does the ancestry research include African-American families uh, that worked at the Episcopal High School and also worked at BTS? Yeah, so anywhere that I mentioned Episcopal High School when I was reading off the names, I, I did that intentionally because up until the seminary was founded in 1823 um, and the high school shortly after there. And in 1923, up until 1923, both the seminary and the high school were one institution shared uh, and they shared a, um, a board, of, board of trustees. And so um, if anyone came up in our records um, as working at either the high school or the seminary up until 1923, they are recorded. So that's a long way of saying yes, <laughs> as long as they were there before 1923. And another uh, question that we had, the quote that you read, Ebony, from uh, that was from Burke and Herbert, from Burke of Burke and Herbert Bank. Are they participating in these reparations? If not, have they been approached to do so? Presently, they are not, or I do, if they are, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, and I don't believe they are approached. It is, um, from day one, I've been saying we got to follow the money because that's going to that's gonna show. And, you know, I would like for that to happen, but um, that's a little bit of a degree. Because <laughs> we still bank with them. So I don't know They're just the complications that, that come with that. I'm not really sure. I can't speak to it. And I'd also like to read uh, a comment from uh, someone who that both of you know from from Joseph Thompson to everyone. Uh, good evening. On behalf of the VTS administration, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Duncan for her excellent remarks and all of the descendants for participating in this project. 
Shar, Maddie, Elizabeth, Chris, for all of the expert research, and last but not least, Ebony Davis for her tireless work and dedication. And I, I second that and say yes, congratulations for all you as of well. the work. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, oh, I would like to also shout out Christopher Pope. He's the he's oh, yes, the yes. seminary archivist, and he's been a part of the research team since the very beginning too, um, and really providing a lot of institutional research um that is is that's housed in the seminary archives oh, and in the last um i mean just you know with more publicity happening i mean definitely you've been in the news about this this program have you seen other programs or have people reached out to you that you know were interested in, in doing this with our organization or our community have you gotten a lot of feedback about about you know possible other possible programs around the country y yes um, um, there's a lot of interest and um, a lot of people, individuals, churches, um, institutions, organizations, schools, universities are all, um, everybody is, is at a different point in the process of reparation. Some are just deciding, okay, we're going to go ahead and do the research and try to find, pull back the curtain and see what's there. Others no, and they are now at the point where they can face it and are having conversations. So there's a lot of people um, in different places or who are at the point of reparations, but maybe not cash payments, but working on um, other creative ways like um, the town in um, Illinois, I believe it's Evanston that's doing um, reparations through real estate or in California, there's a, 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 a land program um, for reparations. So there's um, reparations is coming up, and as it comes up, and people find creative ways to engage in it, um, it they are coming coming our way and knocking. <laughs> no, and that's that that is a really wonderful thing. Uh, one of the other parts of your presentation, Ebony, that you did in the beginning was showing uh, the, the books and the documents that people were going through, and you were saying when the researchers were sort of digging through the archives, and you were mentioning that these were things that were there but then hadn't really been fully explored. Uh, are there a lot more items in this archive where we'll be finding a lot more exciting history that hasn't been touched on yet? I, I don't know. I don't think so, but I I, I don't fully know. Um, the research team has spent their time in there, especially once the library was fully back open. Um, and and what, what we're working on now to to big things and as we gear up for the, the gathering on June 3rd uh, is, a, is a map. So we can really start to have a visual of the campus and place all of these names and all of these people who we know in different places on campus so you can see where your grandfather actually worked and what, what area he would have been his route walking back and forth. And, um, and so that those maps, um, Many of them are in the archives. Many of them are with the city. And so we'll be working on, in those two uh, record groups to piece together that image. Um, I, I think I feel safe in saying that things in our archive might be exhausted, but you, you know, the, you never know. <laughs> That's right. You never, you never really do know. But you're saying that with what you're doing with this research that uh, Mrs. Duncan could then, like maybe a year or two from now or down the road, really trace her family precisely where they were on a map and like they were you know working in this part of the facility for this many years and uh, one you know, day we hope it can be that extensive where where you can pinpoint that um but even in the in the very near future like the next time you come to campus tonet there may be a map that you can look at and point to just of the seminaries campus um and see you know we, well where the um the chapel was or the uh, as um we just saw a map that showed where the colored chapel was or where um where the blacksmith shop was or the laundry these are things we don't know where they are just yet but we're hoping to find them and to place them so that we can place the people and the and the um the work that they did and and kind of bring it to life a lot more and when um i was when you were I mean, I was going through your website, which I have to say is a wonderful website. So people have not gone to the VTS website to see it. And there is an introductory video that you have. Uh, so I'm seeing in, in the background when you were doing that introductory video, there was a video screen behind you. So is there an orientation if I were to come to VTS to tell me 
you know, when I walk in that this is one of the projects that you're doing if I'm, if I'm visiting the campus? Is there, or do you have plans for an exhibit about this with this wealth of history that you have on the, as a museum person, I'm, I'm dying to know that, so. Um, there, there's no orientation video. There is our program video that's on the website, like you said. Um, there is a campus tour that would occur before COVID um, took over. And so as, um, as descendants come to the campus, we give them an informal tour, but we're gearing up to have more scheduled tours as they come. Um, and so that the video, showing the video could definitely be a part of that. Um, in 2023, next year, the seminary will be, will be marking its um, bicentenary 200 years. And so there will be some thing. <laughs> I don't want to say an exhibit just yet because I can't make that promise. Um, but there will be something it, or more likely what, what Joe and I would really like are, are some things, multiple things, programs, events, some kind of display that really um, acknowledges and recognizes and honors the descendants and their ancestors at, um, because the seminary would not be working 200 years had it not been for the Black families that worked, built, built, sustained, and labored on that campus for all of those years, even presently. Well, hopefully, maybe I can have you back for a sneak peek in 2023 so we can, we can give us a sneak peek about some of these activities that will be coming up. And we've had some more questions in the chat. Has there been coordination uh, with the city and Fort Ward and its history as a place where many who worked at VTS lived? And there's a lot going on with new interpretation at Fort, Lord, Fort Ward of the African-American community that parallels the Civil War history that's there. So they're acknowledging the families that were displaced from the fort, but have you been working with staff there or is that a, a future goal? It, it definitely is in the future. Um, in, in all honesty, this, this is a very large undertaking and we kind of are, are um, phasing it out, if you will. The descendant part is a very personal and intricate piece. And so um, to add in navigating that with other parties and other institutions and um, it, it it would make it a lot more complicated. So as we try to really focus on the relationship building, we're just, we're working with the descendants exclusively right now. And then we will hopefully be able to have the bandwidth to branch out as we um, have the program more streamlined in the future. No, and that, that's very good to know. Thank you for, for sharing Can that. Can I just and jump in on something? Absolutely. You Absolutely. At Fort Ward. As you know, in Fort Ward, there is the Oakland Baptist Church Cemetery. Yes. Well, as right now there, and there's a number of us in seminary who are uh, very concerned that there's an area that we know um, was possibly burial ground because as we know that um, in, the, in the history of blacks, you, you lived and you also buried your beloved somewhere on your land. So um, there's talk of of repositioning a playground to an area that is, should be deemed sacred and holy. So we are a seminary group working to make sure that nothing is built on that land. So I'm glad you mentioned the Fort Ward. It gave me the opportunity to say, we hope that does not happen, City of Alexandria. And uh, Mr. Duncan, I'm so glad you brought that up too, because I was actually uh, last weekend meeting with a descendant uh, who has family buried at the mm -hmm. fort and um, that we can, and that is a commitment. And one of our strongest commitments, and we say it in our racial equity statement about Fort Ward is that we want to make sure that nothing happens on sacred ground yes. where family members are buried. And we have that commitment uh, with the Office of Historic Alexandria, with the, the Department of Recreation, with all, uh, with our equity work in Alexandria to make sure that descendant wishes are honored and are a priority in anything we do at Fort Ward. So I'm glad you brought that up. And there will be an upcoming Fort Ward meeting uh, in, in April, in uh, early April. So we will get that information out to everyone. And you can find any information about updates on public meetings on our This Week in Historic Alexandria. And if you're not signed up for it, I encourage you uh, to sign up so you get the most recent updates. And always check our City of Alexandria website. So Mrs. Duncan, thank you. Thank you for Thank doing you. it. And I, and I, I, I hope, a, you know, just one other thing. I oh, hope sure. if, if it is where they decide that nothing will be built there, then 
the next step that I would think could happen is that a permanent marker could be erected so that we don't have to go through this uh, a year from now when somebody else has a bright idea to build something there because it would be it would be earmarked as historical, uh, sacred and holy ground and nothing is to be built there. So that is something that I hope can be considered. Yes, absolutely. And that's actually one of the things we were meeting about markers. So that, thank you for bringing that up again. I appreciate that. It's really, okay. really important because we do want, one of the most important things and one of the things that's coming up this Saturday is that we're dealing, we are dedicating a historic marker to Earl Lloyd. And one of the most important things that we're doing as a department, Historic Alexandria, is adding more markers around the city relating to African-American history. We've done a number in 2021 and we have quite a few that will go up uh, in 2022 because our history was erased and our sites exactly. are missing. And yes. so we have to make sure that people realize that these were places that mean a lot in our community. So I, I'm glad you brought this up because it was really important to, to port, important to focus on. We've had a couple of other questions come in in the chat. Uh, let me just see. Uh, someone wants to know, um, who can we contact if we find a possible descendant that might have ties to VTS, uh, history of the enslaved or the Jim Crow periods? Um, you can email reparations at vts.edu. Um, you can also just go to our website. The link uh, for all of that, I think is in the chat and there is um, an intake form that you can complete if you think you might yourself be a descendant. Um, and then our, all of the contact information is there too. So that the, the website is the one-stop shop to get information on how to contact us or send information, send your personal information. Oh, great, thank you, Ebony. And another question, is there any information on enslaved persons who were contracted by other slave holders to work at the seminary or the Episcopal high school that you're aware of? Yes. There's a lot though. I mean, that's not a simple, <laughs> the, the simple answer is yes, there is. Um, uh, uh, specifically in Alexandria, um, contract work, hiring out one's enslaved persons for a season or for a specific project was very, very, very common. Um, as uh, the first three women that we, that, um, were uncovered in the research are Millie Sophie and Julia Parker, who were hired out from Mount Vernon. Um, that was a that was the very first, those are the first names we had. And they were that was they were not the last who were hired out. Um, it, it has come up in the research quite frequently. Um, and if we were to expand our research and look at every faculty member and every trustee and every bishop and every um, priest, you would see it, um, that that pattern repeated over and over again. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Duncan, I, as being a part of the reparations program, uh, in, in, I didn't know if you attended the descendant luncheon, if, if you were there in 20. Yes, I was in the picture. I was okay. in the picture. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure, I thought you were, I just wanted to make sure. Meeting, were there new people that you met at the, or were you, when you were there, did you know most of the people or did you learn new things that you didn't know? Um, by sharing information at that luncheon when you were there? I knew most of the people, and if I didn't know them because I was uh, maybe much younger than they were, they knew my sister or uh, my cousin. So, you know, the family, we all know each other's family, basically, yes. And Ebony, I mean, you said you're going to have a, a gala in June? Yes, uh, the evening of Friday, June 3rd, this will be a nice formal gala um, where we can really have a, a ceremony and a program um, to discuss a lot of the research and honor um, honor all of the individuals who worked at the seminary. And so we're really, really looking forward to that. Um, and we're, the planning is underway. Oh, great, great. We already have people, um, so with the luncheon last year, like Tonette joined us from New Jersey. Someone else came from Indiana. Other people came from further um, Eastern Shore, Maryland and further South and wow. Virginia. And so um, I, we're expecting that same range of descendants to kind of ascend on Alexandria and join us as well. So it'll be a great time for us, but also a wonderful time. We're hoping for the families to see one another again. Oh, that's wonderful. Be that community yeah. that they once, that they yeah. all grew up in. I mean, it's a community that knew each other, but it's now being renewed and that that's great. And then 
for future generations, they will have this, this history and a place where they know that it's preserved and protected. And people have asked about uh, a recording of this session. We will have it up on our Office of Historic Alexandria uh, YouTube channel. And we will also share the link with VTS so that you will have it as well. And I know we're get, we are close to eight o'clock or actually a little bit after, after eight, but I just um, wanna say, you know, this has been really an honor to be a part of learning about your, your program at VTS. And I've been so excited that we've been able to do these updates. So I hope that we can continue to do these updates. And it's just been a great pleasure, Mrs. Duncan, to have you share with us and to expand this history to this audience because they are so interested uh, in this history. And it's just an amazing time in Alexandria for African-American history. There are several groups like VTS doing uh, Office of Historic Alexandria, Mount Vernon. There are other historical societies out there. Alexandria, Historic. we are all interested in preserving and trying to right the wrongs that were done in the past and trying to bring equity to our story in Alexandria. And we've been working with the Equal Justice Initiative and meeting with them. And they've been following sort of our progress in Alexandria and looking at us as, as a city overall. And they've just been very impressed, they said, with what we're doing to really uncover this history and to bring it forward and with the community engagement. So you all can be so proud of what you're doing. And I think we can be proud as a city of Alexandria of what we're doing too. We, we have much work to do, but we're doing the hard work and we're having the difficult conversations. So again, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. And I'd also like to thank Michelle Longo who served as our, our tech for tonight's uh, call, uh, tech call our tonight's Zoom. And again, many, many thanks. And I hope I will see you again here in 2023. And Mrs. Duncan, you have always an invitation with us always, and we will keep in touch. And also if you are a descendant and you're on the Zoom and interested in learning what's happening at Fort Ward, please reach out to us because we would like to make sure that all descendants are aware uh, of what's going on and plans for Fort Ward and anything that goes on at that site. And you will see a new interpretation coming soon that highlights more of the African-American histories and the connections between our two sites. So I'd like to wish everyone a very uh, good evening and hopefully you'll join us again soon for a program. We will have the dedication for the Earl Lloyd Marker Saturday at 11 a.m. You can find more information on our website and it will be at 1100 Montgomery Street. So we look forward to seeing you then. And again, Ebony and Mr. Duncan, thank you so much for this great program. Thank you. We thank appreciate you. it.